Hello, good evening. Welcome to Camden Television Menus. Today, the 21st of April 2024. My name is Jeffrey Ziambo to present. Our top stories in the news tonight, a 13-year-old boy dies while swimming towards Kwamboka Royal Boat Dock. Court urged to clarify former President Edgar Lungu's eligibility for future elections. President Hagainde Hichilema advises citizens to embrace hard work. In international news, about 15 million Sudanese in need of urgent health assistance. And in sports news, Kenya records a double victory in London Marathon. These are more stories coming up shortly after the break. Enjoy the benefits of an instant loan with us ranging from 1,000 kwacha to 750,000 kwacha paid express once collateral is viewed, valued and verified. Call us on 0763-595-359 or 0779-432-993. Classified Financial Express, here as your financial friend. Hello again, and the news in detail. A 13-year-old boy has died after drowning at Mulamba Harbour in Mongo District of Western Province. Police spokesperson Ray Hamonga says the deceased, identified as Sianga Mukololo of Mongo's Ilute compound, drowned while attempting to swim from one side of the harbour to the area where the Kwamboka Royal Boat was scheduled to dock. Mr. Hamonga says efforts by police marine officers to save his life proved futile. He says the deceased was rushed to Lewanika General Hospital, where he was pronounced dead. The police further disclosed that the incident occurred on April 20, 2024, around 15 hours. Mino Deputy Inspector General of Police in charge of operations, Miona Muyambango, has described the 2024 Kwamboka ceremony as crime-free. Mr. Muyambango has commended police officers involved in policing the ceremony for their professionalism and commitment to duty. The deputy police chief who was overseeing the security of the ceremony noted that there was no report of illicit activities before and during the colorful event. Republican President Hakainde Hichilema has emphasized the need for government to use established structures in churches to deliver relief services to the people. Speaking when he attended mass at Our Lady of Lords Catholic Church in Mongo, President Hichilema re-echoed on his call for Zambians to embrace the spirit of hard work, stating that it is everyone's responsibility to strive even in difficult times like climate change. This president here must justify why he is the servant of the people out of 20 million citizens. We must work hard. We must be responsible. We must be fair. I think then we can emulate Munisana Wamund. Very briefly, Bishop, I won't abuse this platform because that's what we shouldn't be doing as public workers. And that's why I was very happy yesterday to be an ordinary guest at Komboka, where I have come to for 30 years or so. I don't have to be the guest of honor. We servants of the people. But my message is very simple. We have a duty to do what is right for God's people. That duty is in good times, as you preached, but in difficult times, such as the drought induced by climate change, and as I said, climate change is here to stay. So we should do our best as good shepherds. A 54-year-old former registry clerk at the Provincial Building Engineer's Office under the, the then Ministry of Works and Supply is appealing to the government to pay his outstanding retirement benefits following his retirement in 2017. 
In an interview with Camlet News, uh, Bilki Kabwe, a father of five, laments how he was untimely dismissed from his job on grounds of public interest and how life has proved challenging for him since, considering his disability. Mr. Kabwe of Lusaka's Garden House tells Camlet News that he has, in, he, has engaged in, he has engaged his former employer to seek redress, but all his attempts have proved futile as no absolute guidance has been rendered to him. Here's a report. Buki Kawe, a former registry clerk at the Lusaka Provincial Building's engineer's office, is struggling to fend for his five children and wife after his untimely dismissal by the government in 2017. The 54-year-old man, who is living with a disability, has been the breadwinner of his family. However, since his dismissal, life has been challenging for him. According to Mr. Kabwe, the government is yet to pay his outstanding retirement benefits. He is now appealing to the government to settle this long overdue issue. From 2022, I received this letter. That was in December. And I started to prepare all the documents. After preparing the documents, in February 2023, I represent Yama Papers to building his office, building in his office. Because I have one there. When after presenting the documents, I was told that later on I would process the paper, the files to pensions board so that I could get the pensions contribution to the pensions fund. Unfortunately, from February up to June, there were only promises and nothing absolutely came out. No November. I, 2023, I was told that everybody to approve payment here in the Amateur Benefit. That was on 3rd November. Living in Lusaka's Garden House Township, Mr. Kawe has been in the civil service for over 22 years. He also disclosed that he has spending medical bills that he is unable to pay, including an operation on a tumor which has also affected his speech. The situation has been incredibly difficult for the family as surviving on this economy has become nearly impossible. Mr. Kawe laments that his untimely dismissal from his job on the grounds of public interest has proven to be a severe challenge for him and his entire family. Is that I was not given for the past one year. Even called the accountant to explain why I was not given the, the terminal benefits. And the accountant promised that I would be given before the end of March. At March, I had Peter Shapuapunang. And it has become promises, promises, each and every time I call them. So I don't know what I should do because as I, I have stated earlier on, I am a patient. The tumor which is here has affected my speech. And I should not go in the street and start begging for money when I worked. I should get my money and really invest in anything and help my children who are at school. This is the, uh, uh, one of the documents here at hospital. Here long I have to undergo the, medical, the operations of the tumor. As the family struggles to make ends meet, they hope for a resolution to their predicament. By broadcast time, Kamne TV was unable to get a comment from Mr. Kawe's former employer, Chanda Mwango, for Kamnet News in Osaka. Historian Bizek Piri has sparked a legal debate over former Zambian President Edgar Lungo's eligibility for future elections. Professor Bizek Piri contends that Mr. Lungu's eligibility hinges on whether the first term he served to complete his predecessor's tenure was a full term or not. He argues that the former head of state was sworn in to finish his predecessor's term and was later re-elected for his second term, effectively completing two terms. Professor Piri argues that the former president cannot stand in future elections. He has since urged the courts to clarify, to clarify, to clearly communicate their position on the former head of state's eligibility. Here's a report. Two years, eight months down the line, the issue of former president Edgar Lungo's eligibility to contest for elections still lingers. In 2018, the court declared that the then president was eligible to contest in the 2021 presidential elections due to the fact that he did not serve a full term between 2015 and 2016. 
And in 2021, the Constitutional Court dismissed petitions questioning the former president's eligibility by UPND's Katuba member of parliament, Rambi Kapalasa, and stating that the matter was already determined in the Dan Pule case earlier in 2018. Another petition has joined the previous ones in which Mijelo Chizombe, a Lusaka resident, has petitioned the Constitutional Court to revisit its earlier rulings and declarations that Zambia's 60th President Edgar Lungu was eligible to contest the 2021 general elections. According to Mr. Chizombe, the Electoral Commission of Zambia contravened the Constitution when it accepted former President Edgar Lungu's nomination papers and included him on the ballot in 2021. Commenting on the matter, historian Bizek Piri says the argument of the former president's eligibility to stand in the previous 2021 and future elections, if he intends to, is for the legal system to justify. When he, uh, Red Garong first became president, there was no, the constitution was different. He was just nominated to be vice president and appointed as vice president. So when the president died, he was elected and sworn in. So the issue of, it was not a full term. In my view, I don't know what other lawyers say, but in my view, if you have been elected to finish a term, that term, it doesn't, for me, it doesn't matter how many months, one you want, it is, it is still a term. So that is the contention. Professor Piri says according to the constitution, a president can only stand for two terms, after that they are not eligible. He says the constitutional court must clarify whether the first term he served was a complete term or not so as to determine whether the former head of state served the two recognized terms in the Zambian constitution. It is now up to the courts of law to determine whether the first term around was a term or not, but because he was sworn in and he was elected, he was not just picked, he went through an election to save that thing. So, in my view, I would say he saved these two terms. So, wanting to come back, that would mean a third term, which is not provided for in the Zambian constitution as it stands today. So that is where the, where the bone of contention. So the courts must clearly tell the nation the position in which he stands. This going backwards and forth, backwards and forth is not going to help this nation. According to the 2016 amended Constitution of Zambia number no. 2 chapter 45, a person who has twice held office as a president is not eligible for election as president thereafter. Cherish Sivote for Camnet News, Lusaka. UPND Lumezi District Chairman Kennedy Mwale has advised the people wishing to contest elections in 2026 on the UPND ticket to use recognized structures when undertaking mobilization. Speaking during a meeting organized to fill in vacant positions at district, constituency and ward levels in Lumezi constituency of Eastern Province, Mr. Mali says parallel structures are a recipe for confusion and will not be condoned in the governing party. He reiterates that those vying for the positions of councillor, council chairperson and member of parliament must engage party structures. He says the UPND in Lumezi district has established itself as the party of choice as people are able to see the massive development brought by President Hagainde Hichelema's administration. And speaking at the same event, Lumezi District Commissioner Lufeyo Ngoma implored the UPND members to take advantage of government empowerment programs being offered under the Constituency Development Fund CDF and various government departments such as the Ministry of Community Development and the Ministry of Agriculture. <laughs> Koma apiorere muofesi ya UPND tose tendere pamoza. Mm -hmm. Para wiza na vitenge kapena ni 1,000. As a number of the report muofesi ya UPND. Mbwe ufuma hapo mwenecho upanga program. Uh, kamba nandika? Mm -hmm. Mnyaka wanjiri rapo kwa sikatengwa. Koma maninga tamanyo. Mnyaka wanjiri rapo kwa mwase mbangwe. 
mnyaka wa njiri hapo kuvare mnyaka wa njiri hapo nkuni manyi mnyaka wa pereka ndira machaizo mnyaka wa tiresca ndikutitose tukwenda hapa ndikutipanti ndatondeka ya yeah. kwa mapara kuma ward mupenja ma candidates awa ndi mozo merezgeka kuyambira kansera ma kanso chair ma mp kutana kwenye po tana ward chair rede chair man na komiti yake wa manye mayono tina meeting kukamtoro wo para konsoe se chairman para mpenja na disi munga wa tana panyengwa ene wa wane ivi mkuchita Tuwase tupulika nai? Kwa ma 2026 priest chonde Tisaka ye sereru kafotila independent kwa chandarama Chiza mchizia So, chen tuwane kuti wakaki vintuwa hende sabu imu Wa WDC nao, ma grant, sumu tenga wambiri Laingu pasa la ntwa mozi na la mozi Olo ma grant ya 2024 ya mene ya za choka Ya nai uona list Yanayo ngoenda one side. Ngati ni kamimba kwa mene kunga ila kansi ila kwa mene kuchu. One Zambia. One nation. Nga ni chitunguru kwa mene kuliba kansi ila kwa mene kuchu. Nga ni chamto kwa mene kuliba kansi ila kwa mene kuchu. Wa president wa pili kandalama hizi kutizi kwa dilise mtu wali enzi. Kuti makilabu wali enzi makilabu wa shite buwanji. Atengeku, shino chaka mwapasako waluku, shilaka shina mwapasako waluku. Noti kumozi na kumozi. Zambia Development Agency, ZDA Vice Board Chairperson Ashwini Kumar has called on small-scale manufacturers in the country to partner with the Ministry of Small and Medium Enterprises Development and the Zambia Association of Manufacturers. Mr. Kumar stressed that such collaboration is critical and crucial to achieving visibility and expanding the market. He has advised small manufacturers to engage with the Ministry of Small and Medium Enterprises Development and participate in various government initiatives with chain stores to showcase their locally produced products. Meanwhile, Mr. Kumar has noted the need to speed up the pace of policy implementation to support local manufacturers in Zambia. Here's a report. The Zambia Development Agency is responsible for monitoring the activities of SMEs in the country and their development. It facilitates for programs like establishing strategic partnerships with different SME development organizations and building capacity among small manufacturers. The agency has therefore called on all small-scale manufacturers in the country to partner with the Ministry of Small and Medium Enterprise Development and the Zambia Association of Manufacturers if their goal is to attain national-wide visibility. In an interview, ZDA Vice Board Chairperson Ashwini Kumar says it is imperative that manufacturers partner with such institutions to promote the Buy Zambia campaign. Mr. Kumau says the named institutions have programs running with chain stores that SMEs can take advantage of if they are able to meet the set standards. The SME industry, right? They're running programs with choppies, with ShopRite, with Pick and Pay. And I think it's about capacity building for the small SMEs. Get in touch with ZAM also, because ZAM has, we try and we have capacity building process programs for smaller manufacturers. We have a lot of small manufacturers that started with nothing and have now upgraded themselves and found themselves on the chain store floors. So it is something that is progressive, but it takes time. But if you don't show the initiative and you expect that no, the chain stores must come to them, it's not going to happen. Show that you're getting the quality right, show you're getting your procedures right, show that you're, you're able to consistently supply and you have a sound footing. And I think I, I would encourage, work with the SME ministry for the small manufacturers, work with ZAM for the small manufacturers, to see that you're actually on sound footing when it comes to supplying the chain stores. And the programs are there. He adds that the country has effective policies, but there is need to quicken the implementation of such policies to better the environment of local producers. Part of the uh, agenda that we will be pushing, that we want um, more and more procurement from local industry and I think government has shown that they're going to have what they call positive discrimination or Zambian discrimination which is very very good. We're going to see more Zambian companies supplying the government one, as well as the mining sector and the private sector at large. So what we want is a 
swift uh, implementation of that policy through legislation and also a deliberate uh, call for, for manufacturers in the country to be part of the Proud Zambian campaign so that we are supporting Zambian products. SMEs can contribute to the preservation and sustainable management of natural resources by adopting sustainable production processes, these enterprises can directly help achieve the sustainable development goal number 12 and 15 on biodiversity and protection of wildlife, forestry and water that affect climate change. Cherish Sivote. For Covenant News, Lusaka. The Small Scale Miners Association of Zambia is urging the government not to remove illegal miners from the business, but to instead legalize and provide them with machinery, as they significantly contribute to the country's economy. Executive Director Ngobola Muyembe notes that the solution to end illegal mining and prevent young people from endangering their lives is by creating a space for them to operate freely. He states that young people on the Copper Belt have already identified demand for various materials and have markets they supply to, but they cannot expand due to the lack of tools and safe equipment. We have to make sure that we, we, um, we, um, we, we document those people, guide them. That's also another opportunity, because the way they are mining is very dangerous, but that, the solution does not lie in stopping them. The solution lies in giving them equipment. If you remember what happened when the old ladies were crushing stones along the roads, people came with all sorts of NGOs condemning them and then they drove them off. But those old ladies had discovered a demand for construction um, equipment, or construction, sorry, construction uh, jobs. So instead of giving them quarries so that they can start making bricks, people drove them away. But look at who, who filled the void that was left. You've got all these bricklayers that have come from from other countries and they have basically put their block making on the same spots that these old ladies used to be. So the same approach, you should not let this opportunity go to waste because just because you have got these young people who are, um, are dealing um, in illegal mining, what you do is you give them equipment so that they do safe mining. You give them licenses so that they can excel because they've already identified the demand. This, this notion of disconnecting people from mining and making it a prison of only anyone who comes from outside, it has to come to an end. The National Biosafety Authority, NBA, says it has so far granted 38 import permits, 155 placing on the market. 75 transit, 371 non-GMO certifications, and nine research health-related permits. NBA Communications Manager Sandra Lombe says this is in an effort to ensure that the public has the right information on foods that, that may contain GMO for them to make informed decisions on certain foods and products. She adds that the institution has further intensified assessments of the goods and products on the market ensuring that there is strict adherence to the regulations on matters related to gene technology. Currently, Zambia has capacity to regulate matters related to gene technology. We have the human resource. We also have the uh, laboratories that are able to test and detect genetically modified uh, products. So the labs that uh, we have includes the um, uh, National Institute for Scientific and Industrial Research, we also have the Zambia Agricultural Research Institute Laboratories. The authority has been granting permits since 2015, and a number of permits have been granted for food, feed, and uh, pharmaceuticals, including research activities that are being conducted in the country. Um, just to give an update, like uh, from 2015 to date, as at March, we have granted about 38 permits for imports, 155 permits for placing on the market is to allow people to sell their products that may contain GMOs and we have also granted 75 transit permits. So those that are transiting uh, uh, their products through Zambia, we've granted the 75 uh, permits. We've also granted 371 non-GMO certificates. So these we do grant to those that want to export products that may contain GMOs out of the country and the country where the products are going to require 
a non-GMO certificate. We'll take a break. We'll have more news coming up shortly after the break. Are you looking for a reliable and efficient courier company with international standards? Then let UBZ Courier, your trusted partner in swift and secure deliveries, be your ultimate choice. Whether it's a small package or a hefty consignment, UBZ Courier handles it all locally and internationally. Our modern call center ensures personalized attention for every client. For seamless deliveries within Zambia and beyond, trust UBZ Courier. Call us now on plus 260-763-062-680 or visit us at plot number 15, Mopona Road, Woodland, Lusaka, Zambia. UBZ Kovia, a world-class brand that can be trusted. Potatoes, the unsung heroes of flavor. From crispy chips to creamy mush, potatoes are the versatile superstars of your kitchen. Grown with love by our dedicated workforce drawn from around the community of Palavana. Savenda Farm's commitment is to see to it that we have potatoes that are grown right, healthy, big and tasty. For that quick fix or big celebration or that meal that brings family together, top chefs rely on the Savenda potato to create culinary masterpieces. And for others, it's that icebreaker to a delightful conversation. So, embrace the magic of Savenda potatoes. They're not just a side dish, they're the heart and soul of your kitchen. Savenda, save nations, develop Africa. Impending drought, it's time we look to alternatives of sustaining our crops. We as ISDP are promoting irrigation and water harvesting as the solution to challenges posed by climate change. Watch our 13-week series as we unfold the solutions for our crops. Catch us every Monday at 2040 hours, repeats every Tuesday at 1910. Welcome back. We'll continue with the news. Economist Yusuf Dodia has urged the government to facilitate for a 24-hour economy in an effort to sustain the country amidst the economic challenges it is facing. In an interview with Kamlet News, Mr. Dodia says Zambia should ensure that laws that impede businesses to run after schedule are repealed in order to stimulate economic activities that will project economic gains. Meanwhile, economist Kelvin Chisanga says government should effect in factors should be affecting factors that can sustain the adoption of a 24-hour economy such as security and safety of the public. More in this report. In the last few months, Zambia was a victim of a drought that derailed economic activities owing to the adverse effects in many sectors of the economy such as agriculture and energy. This development subsequently brought with it road shedding, which has equally derailed various economic activities, especially of small-medium enterprises, SMEs, whose businesses are reliant on electricity. With production in many industries reduced, it is no doubt that the country will continue to grapple against economic challenges, which further result in the escalation of the cost of living, as well as that of doing business. Following these challenges, economist Yusuf Dodia has advocated for the implementation of a 24-hour economy. In an interview with Camnet News, Mr. Dodia says adopting a 24-hour economy could potentially revamp the country's economic outlook as production may be increased. Push to achieve a 24-hour economy is not even coming as something strange. It is something that develops by demand. The more people demand the service, the more that that service will be made available more than 8 hours a day, 16 hours, 24 hours a day. So the only thing that government can do is to facilitate it. 
in the past there were laws that says you can only open your business at 7, 07 in the morning and you must shut your business by 17 hours, by law. These are council bylaws. Now a lot of these laws are being repealed. And I think government can continue to do that to ensure that there are no laws that impede or hinder any business from running 24 hours a day. But you will appreciate that even as we speak now, we have a regulation by RATSA that does not allow uh, commuter buses or intercity buses and truckers that are shipping goods across Zambia to operate after 21 hours. In addition to Mr. Dodia's proposal, another economist, Kelvin Sanga, has highlighted the importance of integrating robust security measures and safety protocols into the government's economic strategies before adopting such a move. Sitting now calls for ideas to say that, look, can we make this feature of the 24-hour economy to be part of the national development plan so that it's fully embedded there so that in any case it should not be a ownership of a political umbrella or jacket but it should be now uh, something that can be made into our progressive ideas of what, how we should be able to, to develop this nation. Then when it comes to the broader uh, perspective, I think uh, looking at the African attitude also, that also has really killed us to go that route. Uh, there are few exceptions that we have actually been able to see in Africa, like Tanzania and many other lights, where we are able to see that the issue of um, learning or modeling economic aspiration on 24-hour uh, basis has been embraced like in Tanzania and a few many others, but in the case of Zambia and the situation... Last year, Member of Parliament for Kamfisa Constituency, Honorable Christopher Kangombe, moved the motion in Parliament urging government to transform Zambia into a 24-hour economy, a motion which got mixed reactions. That Zambia needs a 24-hour economy. What is a 24-hour economy, Madam Speaker? A 24-hour economy is basically an economy that allows three shifts in a day. The first workers wake up to eight hours. Immediately they knock off, Madam Speaker. There is demand for goods and services. They must be workers to attend to those who come in the next shift. After those knock off, Madam Speaker, we have learned in so many other countries. Why do we need a 24-hour economy, Madam Speaker? We need a 24-hour economy so that we can address issues of productivity. Madam Speaker, for a small economy like Zambia, the only way we can advance or we can improve our economy is if we are productive. There's no better way to be productive other than to increase productive hours. The only way you can... Chanda Mwango for Cabinet News in Osaka. Minister of Technology and Science Felix Mutati says Zambia will host the first ever World Skills Competition Africa in April 2025. He says the event marks a significant milestone, being the first time the competition will be held on the African continent, and Zambia has been given the opportunity to host the event. He says hosting this event will revolutionize skills development in the country. Unawarded to hold the World Skills Competition Africa, and this will be held in April 2025. And uh, as part of the activities to host this, the World Skills Competition, we are required as Zambia to undertake competitions. And these competitions have been divided in two seg segments. The southern part of Zambia, which means the colleges that are in the southern part of Zambia, and then the colleges that are in the northern part of Zambia. These competitions were done about a week ago. And the competitors selected. The next level will be to bring the North and the South to compete, to select the best of the best. And the best of the best will then be taken to go and compete in Lyon, in France as part of the preparatory journey to hosting the World Skills Day 2025. I should say we are on the right path. But let me also add 
that since the introduction of CDF with 20% of the component going to support skills, we have seen that in the last two years, the number of boys and girls that are undertaking skills has moved from 34,000 to over 90,000 within a period of two years. The Food Reserve Agency, FRA, has received over 6,000 metric tons of grade A white maize from commercial farmers through the early maize program, falling short of the 146,000 metric tons target. According to John Chipandwe, the FRA Public Relations Coordinator, 55 commercial, farm commercial farmers were contracted to grow maize in response to the country's drought situation. Mr. Chipando says the agency expects the remaining balance to be de delivered by the end of June 2024. 6,080.73 metric tons of non-genetically modified grade A white maize, which is equivalent to 121,614 by 50 kilogram bags of white maize, has been delivered to the Food Reserve Agency by commercial farmers that were contracted to grow maize under the early maize program. This followed the launch of the early maize program harvest by the Republican president, Mr. Haga in the Hichilema, on 18th March 2024 in Mukushi district of Central Province at Sadot Farms. So under this special program, 55 commercial farmers were contracted to grow maize as a response, among other interventions, to the drought situation the country is facing. And the contracted farmers have continued delivering maize to FRA. The agency targets to purchase a total of 146,000 metric tons under the early maize uh, program. And as at Friday, 19th of April, 2024, 6,080.73 metric tons of maize was delivered. The balance is expected to be delivered by end of June this year. This special program, initiated by government through the Ministry of Agriculture and FRI as a recipient, is aimed at supplementing other efforts, aimed at replenishing national strategic food reserves to ensure sustained national food security. Immediate past mayor of Luansha and PF member Nathan Chanda has commended President Hagainde Hichilema for commissioning the dewatering of Shaft 28 in Luansha on the Copper Bell province. Mr. Chanda said the dewatering of the mine, which was shut down 23 years ago, is a good development for the people of Luansha. Speaking when Ministry of Information and Media Permanent Secretary Tawakawana visited him at his residence, Mr. Chanda says that the investment of over $500 million by China Non Ferrous Metals Company subsidiary Luansha Copper Mine will benefit the people of Luansha through job creation. The former civic leader said that 3,000 people will be directly employed, thereby changing the face, the face of Luansha. No, we went to very well. Okay. I think that we have come to Luansha. For you, at least, uh, your person has welcome. Uh, I would like to start by commending uh, His Excellency President uh, Akainde Ichirema for commissioning the dewatering of uh, Shaft 28, which was shut down, I think, 20, 23 years ago. This is good news for the people of Luansha, and I, for one, being a civic leader, I'm really excited in a sense that this investment of uh, over $500 million by CNMC Luansha Copper Mines will benefit the people of Luansha greatly. There will be jobs that will be created where 3,000 people will be directly employed. This will change the face of Luansha and it will also give a face of life to the economic and social status of our town. It will reduce crime rates, there will be poverty reduction in our town, 
And not only that, also for the local authority, this will be a booster in a sense that the revenue base that the council has been correcting will go up. Not only that, we have encouraged to see a boost in the social corporate responsibility. We we'll take a break. Join us for international, uh, international sports news shortly after the break. Enjoy the benefits of an instant loan with us ranging from 1,000 kwacha to 750,000 kwacha paid express once collateral is viewed, valued and verified. Call us on 0763-595-359 or 0779-432-993. Classified Financial Express, here as your financial friend. Water is life. Each drop counts and each must be cherished. Our tried and tested product meets all international standards. With our smart drip technology, we aim to deliver precision irrigation designed to reduce blockage and wastage, ensuring a high yield. Renglow, your smart irrigation partner. And now in international news, the ongoing war in Sudan has crippled the country's health system. Seven-year-old Mohammed is homeless. He began showing symptom, symptoms of an enlarged spleen and severe anemia at the age of two. The hospital in Khartoum, where the boy used to receive care, was destroyed in the conflict and his family fled for safety to Port Sudan, which has remained relatively safe and has better medical condition. Here's a roundup of international news for more. The ongoing war in Sudan has crippled the country's health system. Seven-year-old Mohammed is homeless. He began showing symptoms of an enlarged spleen and severe anemia at the age of two. The hospital in Khartoum, where the boy used to receive care, was destroyed in the conflict and his family fled to Port Sudan with limited means. The eastern city has remained relatively safe. <laughs> The conflict has forced us to leave our hometown and become displaced. We arrived here in Port Sudan some 20 days ago to seek treatment for my son. He needs blood transfusions and treatment every six months. Mohammed is still unable to be admitted to any hospital due to lack of beds, though. For those who are lucky to receive medical consultation, the lack of medicines has been an issue. 80% of the country's medical institutions have stopped services. We're facing a sharp increase in demand for medical services and we're facing a huge challenge in terms of our drug reserves and technical capabilities. Antibiotics, painkillers, oxygen and blood in particular have been depleted in most hospitals. The shortage of medicine is a serious issue. We can't buy any medicines. Common drugs for diabetes and high blood pressure are unavailable unless you have a way to order them from abroad. According to the World Health Organization, around 15 million Sudanese have been left in need of urgent health assistance. Dozens of volunteers gathered in Lagos on Saturday ahead of the 2024 World Earth Day. Sesti Vibes, a local environment advocacy group, led volunteers to a market to pick up plastic dumped on the streets and clear the gutters. World Earth Day is observed annually on the 22nd of April, but the entire month is often called Earth Month. We don't have to wait for days like the World Earth Day for us to become more conscious of our environment. This planet is all we have, and if we don't put our hands together for us to ensure a sustainable future, no one else will. World Earth Day serves as a call to action for individuals, governments, businesses, and civil society to work together towards a greener and more sustainable world.
Why it seems as if most people don't seem to care about the environment is because um, sometimes the effects, the, if, the harmful effects on the environment are not so tangible until they become large scale. So for you to um, see the effects of your actions on the environment, it has to become large scale. For example, we didn't know anything was wrong until we started seeing the effects of the changing climate. Volunteers at Saturday's event were divided into teams including one devoted to advocacy, another to clean up and one advertising recycling subscriptions. The teams visited different communities. We are all humans and we can be careless with disposing of waste. But if the government can have environmental officers everywhere, they sure could arrest offenders. It is estimated that Nigeria produces more than 2 million tons of plastic waste a year. However, it faces significant challenges with waste management. Egypt's foreign minister was hosted Saturday by his Turkish counterpart. Sameh Shokri's visit to Istanbul was part of the preparations for Egypt's president's upcoming visit to Turkey. The war in Gaza and the escalation between Israel and Iran were also high on the agenda. We have warned since the beginning that war in Gaza will lead to the expansion of conflict and tension in the region, and we have seen that in the targeting of maritime navigation in the Red Sea and its effect on the international economy. And now, with this tension and military escalation between Iran and Israel, we call upon both sides to show restraint and not to slip towards a wider frame of military confrontation, whether direct or indirect. This doesn't serve the interest of the Palestinian people, nor stability in the region. The comments came on the same day Iraq said it was investigating a deadly blast on one of its military bases hosting an Iran-aligned group. Turkey's top diplomat warned against disregarding the roots of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. If this crisis is not resolved in the way it deserves, if the Palestinians are not given the state, independence and sovereignty they deserve, such crises will continue to increase in our region. Other countries should not think they will not be affected by this, thinking that this will only happen in the Middle East. As we have said since the beginning, everything related to the Palestinian issue has the potential to trigger global divisions and does trigger them. The visit of Sameh Shukri to Turkey comes days after the political leader of Hamas met with Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan. And in sports news, Kenyan Perez Jepchechia set Sunday, April 21st, a world record for a women-only marathon as she won the London Marathon. She may have been more focused on securing a chance to defend her Olympic gold than on setting a world record for a women-only marathon. She ended up doing both. Jeb Churchill had by far the strongest finish as she easily left her rivals behind to sprint alone down the final stretch in front of Buckingham Palace. The 30-year-old athlete finished in 2 hours, 16 minutes, 16 seconds with Tigist Asefa in second and Joycelyn Jebkosge in third. More in this report. Kenyan Paris Jeb Churchill set Sunday a world record for women's only marathon. Jeb Churchill had by far the strongest finish at the London Marathon as she easily left her rivals behind to sprint down the final stretch in front of Buckingham Palace. The 30-year-old athlete finished in 2 hours, 16 minutes and 16 seconds. Ethiopia's Tixt Asefa came second and Kenyan Jocelyn Jebkosge third. Kenyan Alexander Mutiso Munyao finished the men's 42-kilometer race in 2 hours, 4 minutes and 1 second. Ethiopia's Kenenisa Bekele arrived second and Britain's Emil Kares third. The Kenyan double win came on the day the London Marathon remembered last year's champion. Kenyan Calvin Kiptum died in February, aged 24. To end the news on Kamiya Television, the top stories once again. A 13-year-old boy dies while swimming toward Kwamboka Royal Boat Dock. Court urged to clarify former President Edgar Lungu's eligibility for future elections. President Hagende H. Lima advises citizens to embrace hard work. And in international news, about 15 million Sudanese in need of urgent health assistance. In sports news, Kenya records...
victory in London Marathon. And uh, uh, a coming verse of the day is coming from the book of Proverbs 25, verse 28. He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without wars. Thank you for watching Kamala Television Menus. My name is Jeffrey Siambo. Good night.